some nice pictures to sell Newcastle there and, and HMRI for you all. Uh, Nettie's given me a wonderful introduction, so I shan't linger. Um, so this year our theme is CF life in the fast lane. Um, from everybody's perspective, I think that's probably very, very true. We want to see the whole spectrum of, of life regarding cystic fibrosis and, and really where things are going. Not just in terms of treatment and changes and research, and you're certainly going to hear enough about that, but just life. Life for us all is in the fast lane, and why would it be any different for people with cystic fibrosis? They just have so much more that they have to bring along and cope with at the same time. So these changes, and change is a very important word, are the things I'd like to just touch upon in my, my brief talk to you this morning and perhaps have everybody to reflect upon over the next few days. So we'll start with a little bit of science. You'll hear lots about this, I'm sure, and, and for that matter, you probably know lots about this already. We start with a, a disease and we start understanding and thinking about a disease in terms of, of the physiology and the science that sits behind it, at least us clinicians do, um, very much where we're coming from. Um, so with cystic fibrosis, it's of course a, a problem which is related to all parts of the body, not just the lungs, not just the pancreas, not just the gut. And it relates to this very, very humble little chloride receptor which is sitting there. It would seem to be a very innocuous thing and, and dysfunction of a chloride receptor would seem to be such a, a minor problem. But of course that's not the case. And where the, the chloride channels don't work properly, we can't move adequate salts into mucous membranes. We can't lead then to adequate water flowing there and that will lead to significant impairment and build up of things like mucus once my mouse comes back. And so if you have CF, no matter what you may have, there's a, a primary problem, of course, with the chloride channel and how that chloride channel works. Now, we've only known and understood this for a relatively short period of time. We've only really understood the genetic abnormalities behind cystic fibrosis since 1989. And in that time span, a considerable amount of understanding about the basic science has occurred. But really, in the last two to three years, as we've finally been able to fiddle around with this chloride channel, we suddenly realise there's a whole lot of other things that are going on here. And when we can open it up and make it work, albeit in only a small number of cases, we start to see other parts of the body becoming involved and start to understand the importance of this, both in terms of mucus hypersecretion, uh, uh, dehydration of the mucus, but also importance in regard to the immune response and, of course, the GI tract, the pancreas, and a whole host of other organs that are involved. So, although you may not be able to see this too easily, I mean, you can see it better than I can see it on my screen. Cystic fibrosis is a really complex disease. So if this was a scientific presentation, I'd be saying, don't write all of this down. It's just really there to, to remind you, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yes, we know all about what goes on in the chest, and that's obviously a, of, of significant importance with recurring chest infections, dehydrated mucus, difficulty to clear that mucus, and then progressive lung disease. But of course, we've got the GI problems, the malabsorptive difficulties, the meconium ileus, etc. Liver disease, particularly at a, at a young age, is a, a significant problem. Gallbladder disease becomes an issue. And of course, as we get older, we start to get other complications, such as osteoporosis, problems with reproduction, hypersplenism that can occur secondary to liver disease, sinus disease, all of these sorts of problems. An enormous amount of difficulty. And not surprisingly, our treatments are just as complicated. So our main goals of treatment are to try to arrest some of these problems. In reference to lung disease, we hope to optimise and prevent the development of serious lung disease and the development of serious and, and chronic infection and slow that decline in lung function which occurs. We want to achieve and maintain adequate nutrition and growth. We want to maintain liver function and prevent the decline. We want to prevent and treat any intestinal dysfunction that occurs, and that's really an ongoing problem. <clears throat> we want to identify and treat complications such as diabetes. We want to identify and prevent osteoporosis. And we want to assist with fertility. And finally, and not least, but one perhaps that we need to, to think about because I suspect it often gets left off, 
we want people to live happy and as well as they can normal lives and we want to help them do that whilst we're doing all these other horrible things to them and asking them to present and have assessments and reviews etc etc as we go on this is a lot to ask of our patients and this is a lot to ask of our teams there's a lot going on so things have changed considerably cystic fibrosis is a disease really only got uh, as talked about and described in the early 1930s. And as you can see from this survival data that comes from the United States, survival at that time was exceedingly poor. Children were not expected to live beyond the age of five years. It was a, a disease of, of extreme severity of which very little hope could be, could be held out. Children were malnourished and rapidly deteriorated and usually died from respiratory tract infections at a very young age. Things improved considerably, and things have continued to improve considerably. We've seen significant improvements from the 1950s onwards. None of that because we've had magic cures or things that have really sought to, to arrest the development of the progression of disease, but just good care and understanding about attention to nutrition and even an understanding and attention to things such as infection control has made quite a difference. And we've seen this continue to climb. But in fairness, it's not really enough. There's still an enormous unmet need in regard to CF. We still have a median survival in our late 20s, probably a little bit older now. And so that means that we're still getting a significant burden of disease and we want to push this further forward all the time. We have a long way to go. So we've also got a wonderful resource here in Australia, which is the Australian Cystic Fibrosis Data Registry. Now, this would seem to be a not very exciting sort of initiative, but this is something that Cystic Fibrosis Australia has funded since the, the, the early 1990s. And we have collected data on our patients from all of our major clinics now throughout that period of time. This has been a long time in the making, a long time maintaining, and an extremely costly venture which has never been supported by government. And yet, it provides us with the description as to what's going on and how we are doing, both for ourselves, but also in reference to the rest of the world. We now publish our CF Centre comparisons, so you can look up and you can see how your centre is doing. The names are there, it's all very transparent, it's on the website, it's not the easiest thing to find, but anyway, that's not <laughs> by design. Um, <laughs> But we think it's very important that, that, that we are seeing how we're going and, we're see and that the people who come to our, our centres also see how we're going as well. So we've seen a significant improvement in lung function over that period of time. We can see this is a slow but steady rise in our median lung function. So this is FEV1, um, both in males and females. And this is age 6 to 11 years, really just to illustrate things for you. But what's really interesting is that in 2013, this is what we see when people transition into the adult clinics. And these are the populations that we have in our adult clinics. You can see that there's a large and ever increasingly large proportion of people with only mild lung disease or essentially normal lung disease, at least as measured by spirometry. We still obviously have, oops, sorry. We still obviously have people at the severe end of a range. I have a pointer, I should use that, shouldn't I? Okay. <laughs> um, we still have people at the more severe end of a range, um, as, as we would expect. But this increasing number of people with a milder burden of illness really does reflect that march towards less severe disease, which is present. In terms of nutrition, we've really done much better than what we have in terms of lung function. And this has really been the case since the 1970s up to the 1980s, where we've stabilised and ensured that in our paediatric clinics, our kids really have great nutrition. And by the time they're reaching adolescence and moving into adulthood, they essentially have, have normal levels of growth and normal levels of nutrition. And so this is a far more plateaued curve. And by the time we've got people into adult clinics, essentially, the vast majority of people have a normal body mass index as a, as a rough guide to adequate nutrition. And essentially cystic fibrosis is moving out of being what was always regarded as a paediatric disease. 
children are transitioning into adult clinics and increasingly this is now becoming an adult-based disease. We will pass the 50% mark of cystic fibrosis patients in this country being in adult centres in the next year or two. This is an important change and really reflects a great deal of success in terms of treatment in those early life diseases. But the improvements that we've seen have far outstretched our abilities and our, our planning on a health perspective. And this has not really been acknowledged and has really lagged behind in terms of what our health authorities are able to fund and what the expectations are as children move and their families move from paediatric clinics into adult clinics. It has been a major problem and still needs to be a major problem that needs to be addressed. In New South Wales, some advances have been made recently, partly because of this cystic fibrosis peer review process, which has undergone and based upon the information that this data registry provides for us. Success brings its own problems, however, and as people get older, the complexity of the disease becomes more complex. We start to see really important and difficult problems, such as the development of diabetes, now in over 25%. In fact, in my clinic, probably closer to about 35% of our adult patients will develop diabetes. It's bad enough to have cystic fibrosis, but to have to then cope with diabetes as well, it's a major milestone for people to, to have to overcome and to start to contemplate. And it's always amazed me how well, in general, people take this when, when another major hurdle is put in front of them. Osteoporosis and, and, and disorders like that also become an increasing problem, particularly in those over the age of 40. And, and these are things and new challenges that we're going to have to meet as time goes by. And the burden of illness is still very, very high. So here we see this slow but steady decline in lung function that is occurring. But in order to make that a slow decline in lung function, it means a lot of treatment. A lot of time either in hospital or with programs such as hospital in the home. And we still have this real problem which is occurring here in adolescence through to early adulthood where there is an inexorable decline in lung function which occurs. And once we've lost that lung function, we can never get it back. This critical pine point is really poorly understood why it happens. And I'm sure there's lots of social and physiological reasons why this is occurring, but it remains an important and, and significant mystery in terms as to why it does occur. So, I'll stick with what I know, at least to begin with, um, and talk about saving the lungs and what we're doing. So in this context, lung disease remains still a very important part of care for CF. Unfortunately, the biggest burden of illness still remains recurring chest infections. And our ability to slow the decline in lung function and to reduce the burden of illness due to infection remains a critical way that we can intervene to prolong life and improve the quality of life for our patients. So this is what we're trying to do. We have a disease where we lose lung function at a much faster rate than what the natural population does. If you see this, we've got a slow but steady decline for those of us, unfortunately, once you reach the age of 25, your lung function goes down. I'm really sorry about that. It just does. The rate of that decline, however, is faster in people with chronic lung disease. And in cystic fibrosis, that decline is obviously extraordinarily fast. When we're trying to treat CF lung disease, we're looking at the long picture, not just the problem which is sitting in front of us. We are really trying to push this curve up to here. We've had lots of little successes along the way and we've been able to push it a little bit along, not really by doing anything specifically, just by trying to minimise infection, trying to maintain nutrition, having better antibiotics, having, having close monitoring and regular treatments. But we need to push it along a bit faster. And obviously in the last few years, we've seen the ability of that start to occur as we've been able to target some of the underlying mechanisms that lie behind the development of cystic fibrosis. And I, of course, refer to the CFTR modulators, things like Kaleidoco and Ocambi. But guys, we want to get to here and we still have a long way to go.
So that decline has improved over time, and these are not very long timelines, okay? The dark blue line represents 1990 and the decline in lung function which has occurred back then, and here we have 2008. And so you can see in the age of 6 to 30 that FEV1 has actually improved by more than 10 percentage points. Just pretty much well, most of us have been involved in CF care sitting in the room here, which is quite a remarkable achievement and really does need to be highlighted because I think we forget that significance. And if we go back to that US data that I showed you along the way, it kind of reflects, well, how have we achieved some of these changes? What have we done in the past and what can we consider doing in the future? Well, as I said, the very, very poor survival that we had down here was really little impacted by treatment for quite some time. We had the onset of antibiotics only occurring here. Up until then, of course, we didn't have any antibiotics that we could use. Penicillins, um, some uh, very, very toxic uh, medications, some which are incredibly toxic that we still use and now use in more effective ways, such as via inhalation, um, which, of course, colistin is one of those. But we saw a steady and significant rise in survival well before we had any significant, specific treatments for cystic fibrosis. We don't come to here with nebulised DNAs and we've achieved all of this. And this is all about good nutrition, good care early in life, identifying the disease early, getting the teams together and appreciating that this is a complex disease that requires management in a multidisciplinary team environment. Very, very few chronic diseases are managed in this way. And this really is a model for the management of chronic disease overall. We've finally got a bit of a push along as we've, we've gotten a bit cleverer, we've understood what's gone on, we've identified the CF protein here only in the 1980s, and the CF gene, of course, was identified in 1989. Gene therapy, unfortunately, hasn't really resolved any, any significant treatments for us, but we've started to be a little bit more clever the advent of, of, of nebulised DNAs, although it took nearly 10 years to get it licensed in this country, um, hypertonic saline, azithromycin, bronchitol, and now, of course, the CFTR modulators. We've done a lot to get to this point, and it's really good, but I think the promise is there to go even further. And we've got a fairly complex picture that we want to try and arrest here. We've got treatments that hopefully now are going to start to target the underlying abnormality, the defective CFTR, that leads to the reduced and the viscous airway surface liquid. This leads to impaired mucociliary clearance, and we have treatments that, of course, target this to try and improve that. Nebulised DNAs or palmazine. Once we get that infection which is occurring, then that becomes an increasing problem. Improving that clearance can be helped by things like bronchitol and hypertonic saline. We now want to treat infection when it occurs early, and eradication of pseudomonas seems to be a key part of this. But once it becomes established, we also want to start to suppress that infection to limit any further damage. And eventually, we hope to mitigate that so that this horrible cycle of disease, infection and inflammation doesn't get out of hand. But of course, at this point in time at least, when the burden of infection becomes too much and our lung function becomes too impaired, we must look to transplantation in order to arrest the process any further. So I just want to talk about a couple of important areas where I think that CF care and CF research needs to be going. Now this in particular um, I think is, is, is where the changes have occurred. Now these few slides here that I've got have actually come from Peter Sly and this is the Arrest CF team based in Western Australia um, and Melbourne and they've provided some fantastic work which has led to some very high-end publications of recent years understanding this disease, particularly early in life. So the Arrest CF program is an early life surveillance program. CF is of course diagnosed by newborn screening as it is across Australia. The initial assessment occurs very soon after diagnosis at three months of age. They have annual assessments then as part of a program through to six years. Of course, they keep having annual assessments. Um, they have both a clinical and a research component and they consent the patients. And overall, but most importantly, 
there's been a fantastic degree of participation in those centres, greater than 95%. And because of that, they've got fantastic data that means something. Patients undergo CT scan, which of course at that age, for those of you who have parents of small children, means a, a general anaesthetic. They have a quick BAL or bronchoalveolar lavage to obtain samples. They have infant lung function testing done, which is kind of like squeezing little babies, but anyway, that's paediatricians for you. Um, gets a bit better as they get a little bit older. Um, the kids don't seem to mind it. They don't even wake up, but if you're sort of shuffling around in the back of a room and you drop something, the child wakes up and you get dirty looks from the technicians. Um, and of course, they do lavage to look for some novel biomarkers as to this disease as well. So they find that very, very early on, they can start to see evidence of lung disease, and part of that lung disease is irreversible. Now, the first sorts of things that they see changing is this sort of thing called air trapping. So when the kids breathe out, air gets trapped into the lungs rather than getting expelled out. Now, a little bit of air being trapped is normal, but too much gives these black areas occurring. And that means the little airways narrow down and close prematurely, and that traps the gas inside. More seriously, however, they could see even at an early age in some children that bronchiectasis starts to form. And bronchiectasis is, of course, the damage to the airways themselves where that infection and inflammation eats away at the airway and makes it larger than what it should be. And so you can see through these ages here that you start to see lung disease. The air trapping in black occurs very, very early on, even at three months. And there's a slow but steady rise in a proportion of children in the development of bronchiectasis. So they've looked at this very closely. They found that they can see air trapping at the age of three months. They start to see infection at a very early age and unfortunately even pseudomonas, which usually then prompts treatment. Um, they find a lot of inflammation in the lungs as well and that's important as I'll show you in a moment. And by six years, 78% of these kids, unfortunately, have an infection which is chronic with something. Maybe not pseudomonas, but nonetheless with something. Successful eradication of pseudomonas is then done and can be detected, and they can see early lung disease developing. So those who've got more inflammation in their lungs are more likely to develop bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis, this irreversible type of lung disease that children, even at these very young ages, get. And you can see here where you've got lots of neutrophilic inflammation in the red, the proportion with bronchiectasis, so that's 50% there, 75% without bronchiectasis, my, my apologies, um, considerably increase as time goes by. Whereas if you don't have a lot of inflammation present, the development of that bronchiectasis is much, much less. And it's really the presence of that inflammation is the one factor that seems to identify it. So with these kids, if they've got lots of inflammation, that's a really bad sign. What we do about that, how do we target that, is of course the next question to ask. But this is what we call a logistic regression analysis, and it shows that the more active the inflammation in the lungs, the more likely these children are to develop bronchiectasis. Well and above all these other factors up here, such as BMI, sex, pancreatic insufficiency, or even the presence of infection by itself. So, in terms of childhood disease, Early disease and the progressive development of lung disease in CF are really critical factors. But we are starting to understand the physiology behind this disease really well. We have a well-identified patient population. And more importantly, we in fact have well-identified multidisciplinary teams present. Cystic fibrosis is unique in its ability to offer that sort of treatment for people. And it is unique in that it has a well-defined patient base and a really supportive general population that are behind them as well. It's moving into this era that we start to call precision medicine, where we really understand what's going on and we can target what's going on for the individual sitting in front of us. Up until now, we come up with a diagnosis. Asthma, heart disease, cancer. But targeting treatment is far more complicated than that. 
There isn't one pill that you take for asthma. There isn't one type of chemotherapy that you use for lung cancer. There has to be multiple treatments and they have to understand both the physiology behind it, but most importantly, the patient in front of you and how that patient will respond to the treatment in front of you. And CF is really up there in terms of this whole concept. So precision medicine, as defined by the NIH in the US, is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention. It takes into account individual variability in terms of their genes, their environment, and their lifestyle. And while significant advances have been made in selected areas, we need to do more, and particularly in the areas of chronic disease. So recently, in the State of the Union address, this whole area was identified by Barack Obama. This is really important. This is where medicine is heading. And he said that doctors have always recognised that every patient is unique. Sometimes we do. And doctors have always tried to tailor their treatments as best they can to individuals. So you can match a blood transfusion to a specific blood type. And that was an important discovery. But what about getting behind these diseases? You match a gene to the abnormality which is in front of you. And then you can decide the right treatment and the right dose in the right patient. So the future of precision medicine is hoped to enable healthcare providers to tailor treatment and prevention strategies to everybody's unique characteristics. It involves understanding their genome, the microbiome of what lives inside them, their health history, their lifestyle and their diet. And we have to incorporate all of these things to try and come up with a, a viable solution for those individuals. And at the end of the day, we need good research and we need data that everybody can see and get access to. So CF was mentioned in Barack Obama's address as one of the critical areas of development in precision medicine. So as I mentioned, in 1989, the CF gene was identified. This is the front page of Science, where the um, publication was first put out. And of course, the little boy sitting here is this young man who's still alive today in the US. And it reflects, of course, the significant improvement in survival which has gone on in that period of time. Mind you, not directly because the gene was identified, but as part of a process that led to this. And we now have a much greater understanding as to what's going on and why this is the case. We have great ideas now as to how the chloride channel is even structured. And at the same time as the gene was discovered, this was just being worked out so that we understand what it looked like and how we can start to open it up. And without this information, we would never have been able to find the drugs that can modify the way the chloride channel works. And that has, of course, led to finders of CFTR modulators that can actually change the underlying disease process. The first of these, of course, was either CAFTA or Kaleidico which affected the gating mutations. Now, I'm only going to touch upon this because you're going to have an excellent international speaker talk to you all about CFTR modulators later today. But just as an example, here we have Ivacafta. It targets a specific mutation, and there are specific abnormalities of these chloride channels that affect patients with CF. Lots and lots of almost incomprehensibly named genes down here. Delta F508, if you're probably aware of, it sits there. G551D, a gating mutation of these class three abnormalities. And basically, you make the protein, it goes to the cell surface, but it does not open. The door stays locked. Ivacafta or Kaleidico opens the door. You've got the protein in place, you use the medication to open the channel and the chloride channel works. It's as simple as that. So we're dealing with a subset of people. Here we come back to this concept of precision medicine again. A subset of people with an abnormality, a very specific genetic abnormality that we can target. And by identifying them, knowing who they are, knowing where they are, a designer drug comes along, we can treat them with that. So, gating mutations, particularly G551D, um, thank you very much to our Irish heritage. <laughs>
um, has been transported most of the way around the world, and Australia has one of the highest proportions of patients with um, G551D or the other gating mutations um, across the world, at just under 10% of our, our total CF population. But it's knowing this data and having this data available which is essential if you're going to roll this treatment out. So trials were then designed. Patients were found with this gating mutation and recruited to these trials. We knew who they were, we knew where they were, we had the teams in place ready to go in order to be able to do these trials and we knew what endpoints we wanted to look at. All of this we knew before we had the drug available. So people received either Ivacafta twice a day or placebo and then of course were allowed to have Ivacafta at the end of the trial period. Fairly short periods of time, only up to 48 weeks there, a little bit under a year, but nonetheless important enough we knew that we'd be able to see changes. Now this is data that relates to sweat tests and it's not exciting in its own right, sweat tests don't make people sick or well, but it really shows you how well the medication works. It fixes the chloride channel. You go from having an abnormal sweat test to a completely normal sweat test in both of the clinical trials. And this is quite a remarkable change. It really does work. CFTR function is restored in this group of patients. And it means something. It relates to something that we now understand, FEV1 or lung function. Patients who were treated with this medication 10% improvement in their FEV1, those with placebo, probably a slight decline over the 48 weeks of the trial. And this occurred really quickly. That wasn't really something that we anticipated. But it happened really within about that 14 to 28 day window, an interesting change. And it led to fewer problems. So this is time to first exacerbation. If you were on Ivacafta, then you went longer before you had an exacerbation compared to those people who had placebo. So as we travel along here, more and more and more people have exacerbations, but you can see that this is significantly declined when you have the, the group on the treatment with Ivacafta. It's not stopped, but it occurs later and the severity is less. But we've still got to treat the lung disease. And this remains a really important problem, particularly, of course, for people with established lung disease in the first instance. Ivacafta and other CFTR modulators is not going to get rid of the lung disease which is present in people who already have it. It may well have a substantial effect on people at a very early age, but there needs to be a lot done before we get to that point as well. So if we just go back to the Australian CF data registry data again, and we see this declining lung function. And I highlighted earlier the really great results where people have very little lung disease that's present. We still have this group here, however, with very significant lung disease. And that's a problem. And it's declining lung disease over time. So once we've got our group who are adults, we see this steady decline in lung function. Why? What are we going to do about it? How do we arrest that? CFTR modulators are going to go some of that way but they still don't address all of the problems that we have to deal with and will have to deal with foreseeably for the next 20 to 30 years. So exacerbations are a really important problem and perhaps we aren't thinking enough about that. We even struggle to define what we mean by this, but we do know that they are very important. This is data that comes from Canada, around 450 patients with cystic fibrosis and it looks at decline in lung function, but it separates them dependent upon whether they have acute flares or exacerbations of their CF or not. Those people who had two or more exacerbations had a much faster decline in their lung function compared to those groups who did not. A dramatic difference. People having exacerbations are doing much worse. The question is why and what can we do about it? So I took this as an example, this is one of my patients, and I took it over a period of about five years, just plotting their lung function and then going back and seeing what we did at the time. Well, the usual sorts of things, they were travelling along quite well here, they got sick, from memory they got quite sick with an, an infection, and they received some treatment. And their lung function 
very, very nearly came back up, but not quite after treatment. Certainly felt better, still very, very good lung function. Perhaps we got onto it a bit earlier here. Didn't really see a drop in their lung function over time. But at this point, something happened, and we see a much larger fall in lung function. Again, there was no appreciable difference between this episode and this episode, and not at least that we could see, and not at least leading into what had happened to them. But the consequences was far greater, a much greater decline in lung function. They immediately received treatment. They were put in hospital. We did all the things that we normally do. We nearly got back to our lung function. So a good result, something that we'd be happy with. But you can see, we've still probably lost just a little bit of ground. Again, good care, good adherence, good attendance. Something horrible happened here. Now, from memory, there was a whole host of things going wrong at that point in time. And they weren't all medical. There were some pretty major psychosocial issues happening for this individual as well. And one should never forget that as being an important factor as to what happened. But this episode, far more important. A very significant drop in lung function. And even with treatment, you can appreciate we never got back to where we started. So there is not a steady decline. There's this crisis that occur along the way and then a failure to get back to where you started. And we don't understand why that happens and which episodes are the serious ones. So we could try and understand that a bit better and we've got a lot more tools in our toolkit now to try and understand what's behind the person with CF and what may be making them unwell at the time, what predicting factors might be present amongst everything else which is going on. This is a um, machine which can now completely sequence your genome. So you give a bit of blood, you put that in there, and for around about 20K, you get the complete genetic sequence of whatever you want. <laughs> if you've got a spare 20K. Uh, that's pretty cheap, okay? Because when we started doing the human genome, and that was only 10 years ago, it had cost around about $25 million. It's come down a lot in price. <laughs> Still not quite in my price range, but nonetheless. So perhaps if we have a better understanding as to the genetic background, the metabolomics of these individuals, then that's something that perhaps can pick, well, why is this happening and when is this happening for the individual which is sitting in front of us? Infection is a really important part of all of this as well. And infection with organisms such as Pseudomonas clearly is the day-to-day -day reality for most adults with cystic fibrosis. So you all hear about this great little bug. We do so poorly against it. It's always worth thinking about. It's present everywhere. It's present in our drains. It's present in our shower heads. It's present in our homes. We probably need to have a plumber in the multidisciplinary team. <laughs> but the acquisition of Pseudomonas is a problem. And when kids get pseudomonas, there is a rapid decline in their lung function which occurs. And infection with pseudomonas is hard to get rid of. Fortunately now, eradication is possible, at least for a time. But once it gets established, it's a serious problem. So it's highly resistant to antibiotics. In fact, it's one of those microbes that grows in plates with antibiotics. A really distressing thought, I know. It loves living in mucus, get that. It likes a really low oxygen environment and when it's starved of oxygen, it mutates in ways that makes it even more resistant to antibiotics. And it then surrounds itself with this thing called a biofilm, which is a green, sludgy sort of thing, you know, like the sticky stuff that you get with, from the kids at the show. And it hides, and it can hide from antibiotics and it can hide from your inflammatory cells. So the American Disease Asso uh, Infectious Disease Association really highlighted this as a problem. And nowhere more important is this than a problem than in CF. Bad bugs, no drugs. There have not been any new discoveries of antibiotics in the last 12 years. This is a serious problem. Resistance to antibiotics is increasing, but we are not finding new antibiotics to use. And there are no new antibiotics on the horizon. I was in Canberra last week where we were looking at project grants, NHMRC project grants, only two on my panel that were related to cystic fibrosis, 
No new antibiotics amongst them, I can promise you. We do, however, have strategies about using the current antibiotics a little bit more effectively. And inhaled antibiotics, including dry powder inhaled antibiotics, are clearly now a reality. Toby, both the nebulised preparation and the dry powder preparation. There's also a dry powder preparation of colistin. There are trials that have been completed for dry powder preparations of levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin. We also have nebulised antibiotic formations for Astreonam, not available in this country, um, not because it's been rejected, but because the company hasn't bothered to put it in here yet, just to say that, um, and others that are being developed, amikacin, and combinations of inhaled antibiotics, phosphomycin and Astreonam is one. There are several others that are available or moving through the, the pipeline as well. And so that's important. Rather than having two nebulisers, you can have one. Patients will definitely like that. We try and prevent pseudomonas acquisition, but we've done very little to actually think about how we would do that and probably could do more. My comment about the plumber was rather facetious, but nonetheless, perhaps we should think about how people acquire pseudomonas from the environment. Pseudomonas is a living organism. It needs stuff to survive, and one of the stuff that it needs is iron and gallium and chelation of iron, there's actually strategies looking at that to starve the organism. Antibodies to Pseudomonas are being developed. Maybe that something will come of that. Even to the components and more virulent aspects of Pseudomonas as well. And then, of course, the bug has to talk to each other in order to be able to work. And strategies that prevent it doing that and forming biofilms will be important strategies to think about. So, again, you're fortunate to have an entire talk on this by Pradeep Singh from the University of Washington, who's going to talk to you at length about bugs. I don't think he'll be bringing any, though, to show you. All right. Finally, however, we have to consider that we're at this point in time, until we can modify that decline in lung function, we are faced with the prospect that as lung function continues to decline and disease severity increases, and particularly as we fail to control infection, lung transplantation is our only option. Cystic fibrosis in this country is a very important contributor to the lung transplantation program. 26% of all lung transplants that were done in Australia in 2012 were for cystic fibrosis. And this is data that comes internationally, but it's exactly the same in Australia here now. But survival post-lung transplant remains a problem. If you have cystic fibrosis, you do very well, and things have considerably improved since we started doing bilateral lung transplantation as well. If you have a lung transplant and you have cystic fibrosis, your chance of surviving to year one is around about 90%, extremely good. However, chronic lung allograft rejection or disease is an ever-present problem. And unfortunately, we still have a median survival, even in our CF population, of only around about six years. Considerable improvement needs to be taken. And to get there, we need to use a very high burden of disease. Unfortunately, our outcomes for lung transplantation are amongst the worst for our solid organ transplants. And a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of support needs to go into improving that. So you'll be pleased to hear. We've got a few challenges ahead as I reach the end of my talk. I meant not that you've got challenges ahead. We've got increasing numbers, which is fantastic. That's what we want. And increasing numbers of adults with more complex disease. We've got an increasing complexity of complications. And we've got some exciting therapies that are dealing with the underlying physiology of the disorder itself to improve those outcomes. But even with these agents, we've still got a long way to go. Early detection of disease and early interventions, particularly perhaps against the inflammatory nature of a disease, might lead to even further improvements in, in outcomes for us. Better management and more effective tools to manage pulmonary infections are desperately needed and an important area that needs to be developed. Transplantation remains our out. When we've got disease that we can no longer manage, we need to consider bilateral lung transplant. But we need to work on the outcomes there, and Alan Glanville will talk to you about that later today. There is a need to do better, and the only way we can do better is through understanding the disease better, through basic science research, 
and also through important clinical research. The CF community have been wonderful supporters of this over the years. We have a national database which only exists because of the CF community. We have a CFTR modulator, Ivor CAFTA, and of course the new combination agents which only exist because the international CF community funnel the money into their development. What more can you ask in terms of a community to give? But development and pushing research forward is the only way that we're going to improve outcomes. So thank you very much for, for listening today.